introduction, and I'm so excited to be here. I've really enjoyed today getting to peek into the studios and get a feel for the culture of the university, and it's been some really beautiful work, so thank you for sharing it with me. Uh, my name is Therese Graff, and as you just heard, I'm a design director with Mass Design Group. I've been with the office for six and a half years, and again, for the first four, I was based out of our Kigali office, which is located in Rwanda in East Africa, and now I'm located in Boston. And in this time, I've been really lucky to work across a huge range of geographies and all the different areas of focus and specialty within the organization. And so when asked the prompt today for today's lecture, how am I and the work I do relevant, I immediately began to think about the reason that I came to Mass and the organization's founding idea that the design of the built environment can create tangible and resonant impacts on people's lives. And so I'm hoping to inspire you. a little bit, but I will get it for you. That's okay. Um, I'll keep talking a little bit more about Mass because we're here and it, you don't really need the slides. I'll, I'll tell you. Um, anyway, so while design can often be viewed as a luxury, we at Mass believe that it shouldn't be. That really everybody deserves access to good design and equity through that process. And there's a great quote by John Kerry from his book, Design for Good, that I wanted to put up and reference just as a way to help stage that, that set of uh, thinking and how we approach it. And he says, well-designed spaces are not just a matter of taste or a question of aesthetics. They literally shape our ideas about who we are in the world and what we deserve. And what I would add on to that is that it's not only that, it's also how we understand the world and the values that we place upon it. And so I think we as landscape architects especially should think about that really critically because we know that the land is so often overlooked and misunderstood and that we are in a moment in time where we need to critically reshape that thinking to put new unprecedented value upon it. And so MASS's mission, and just in case you haven't heard of it, uh, MASS stands for Model of Architecture Serving Society. A lot of people think it's MASS for Massachusetts or something else, but it is an acronym. Um, and our mission is that design is never neutral. It either hurts or it heals. And through this, we believe that we can advocate for architecture that promotes justice and human dignity. And we've designed and built projects globally that have tried to do this by advancing healing and justice. And I'll show you a few, few projects that I won't speak about, but just to try to give you a better reference. Most of them will be based out of the Rwanda office, but again, we've really, we have four offices now within the US, and that's where a lot of our latest work is coming out today. And since we don't quite have it, I'll also just give maybe a small tidbit about why did we start in Rwanda, because I think that's often a question people come to ask. Thank you. All right, yes, we're in motion. Okay, <laughs> so I already kind of went through this, but again, this is our initial mission statement that it was founded around a simple idea that design of the built environment can create tangible and resonant impacts to people's lives. And again, referencing this really beautiful quote that provokes that thought around the value of design by John Kerry. Our mission statement, again, is to research, build, and advocate for design that promotes justice and dignity, and that design is never neutral. It either hurts or heals. So this is a small subset of some of our projects that I was just about to reference. Um, again, these are primarily coming out of our Rwanda office, which is where the organization started, working with Paul Farmer, who is an international health doctor and who was trying to expand the access to healthcare internationally. And we found that design faces many of the same challenges. Design oftentimes only reaches a limited audience and very rarely those who most need it. And it was through beginning a relationship with him towards the development of a hospital in Rwanda that the organization was started and that we began this path towards designing for justice. And so just to call out a few of these projects, um, up on the top is the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. 
It is a land grant uh, university trying to train the next generation of agricultural practitioners in the country. I, we looked at it a little bit in one of the studios this afternoon, so some of you have a bit more context. And then in addition, we have uh, the University of Global Health Equity, which is a university similarly focused on training the next generation of medicinal practitioners, the African Leadership University, and uh, a couple of other images that help to show additional detail. So today, we are 250 architects, landscape architects, engineers, writers, filmmakers, researchers, furniture designers. We are really this big interdisciplinary, multicultural, <laughs> international organization. And to give a little bit of insight into our culture, I think we really celebrate that diversity and the idea of exchange of ideas across geographies and across themes of thought to really try to come to solutions holistically and that the best design comes when those boundaries begin to disappear and that we begin to think critically about what are the right solutions to the issue. And with this, uh, our offices, just to try to give you a bit of context. So again, we started in Kigali, which is in East Africa and Rwanda. But since we've grown to now have four different offices, the three others of which are located in the United States, found in Boston, Massachusetts, Poughkeepsie, New York, and Santa Fe. And, but again, we've re really worked all around the world, and so the other dots that you'll see on this map are some of the other geographies where we have worked. And so today, I wanted to just give you a little bit more insight into some of the passion that I have around this work. Um, within the Landscape Studio, I'm really passionate about the importance of regenerative design. And some of the earliest roots for this passion probably come from spending all of my time outside as a kid, and I moved around a lot. And so I was always in new landscapes and trying to interrogate them and understand their complexity and identity as they ever seem to be changing. And so today I want to try to take you through how we think about regeneration in our work, and especially how we think about it across scales. And this series of images is inspired by the Eames Power of Ten film. If you've ever seen it, it's fabulous. But really, again, when you think about a topic, the frame of view that you take can really critically change what you see and how you begin to shape an attitude towards that. And I think with ecology and regenerative design, that is ever so present when we look at the scale of an individual plant and how it needs to be propagated and stewarded and allow a healthy life to the way we find ourselves in that landscape, appreciating it and learning from it and finding a home and support, and then how it begins to scale out and shape our world to the scale of impact today with climate change. And there's one little snapshot in the middle of myself and Sierra Bainbridge, who's a, the head of the studio in Rwanda in one of the projects I'll talk about today. And so biodiversity, again, has really become more and more of a topic of conversation within our profession and get, gaining more and more relevance as the concerns and uh, visibility of climate change begin to become clear. And this is seen lately in the biodiversity call to action that was posted by the ASLA that maybe some of you have seen. And again, really starts to highlight how our role as designers can uniquely offer to look holistically at this interface between the natural and the built-in environment, but not just to look at that interface, but to look at it with the idea of new possibilities, to be creative in that viewing, in a way that some of the other professions, when, when they come to that space, may not have the same lens of view. And so again, in case you aren't clear on it, uh, biodiversity is a simple word for the unimaginable, com unimaginably complex sum of all life on Earth. It comprises everything from the genetic diversity within species to the innumerable ecosystems that support life. And again, just to try to help set scale with this, when we look at a global map of biodiversity loss and presence, this image really helps to highlight the scale of change. Uh, it shows where biodiversity intactness can be found 
and where it's being lost. And there's this really beautiful quote from Elizabeth Marema, which states that climate change is a primary driver of biodiversity lost, and climate change depends on biodiversity as part of the solution. So clearly the two are linked and cannot be separated. Oh no. <laughs> are we gonna do another one? Should I wait? Everybody cro <coughs> cross your fingers. <laughs> Should I restart it, do you think? Oh, there we go, okay. Thank you for crossing your fingers. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm gonna bring us back to Rwanda and speak about some of the work that we have coming out of that office that uh, begins to address this topic. And so again, in case you aren't familiar, Rwanda is situated in East Africa as part of the Albertine Rift Zone and is located adjacent to Burundi, Tanzania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Uganda. And as part of the Albertine Rift Zone, it is one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. The, the Albertine Rift Zone is home to 1,000 species of endemic birds and over 5,800 species of plants. And it is beautiful. And when you are in it, it is this like really proliferated <laughs> ecosystem where you just feel life all around you, almost like it's pulsing. But again, it is at a point of being really pr pressed upon and at risk of being lost. And so to try to demonstrate this, I'm gonna uh, scale back to Rwanda and just talk about how population growth, land use change, and the effects of that begin to really highlight this influence. And so here we see, again, a map of Rwanda that shows a population density at, in 1975. Rwanda is the most densely populated country in East Africa and has seen rapid expansion of that population in recent years and is expected to have the population double again by 2050. And so again, it really has a lot of people in a very small space dependent on a landscape that is not changing. And in association with that, we can look at the response of land use in, as a result of this growth. This is a map of land use from 1990 that shows cover th throughout the co country at the time and really shows that there was a high cover of natural ecology at the time, green representing forest cover and the lime green representing grasslands and that it really covers a good majority of the country. But then when we snap ahead to 2016, you can see the effects of that rapid growth and how dramatically this landscape has changed and that the majority of it has really now been transitioned towards farmland, primarily subsistence farmland, that the community is dependent upon for food security and that some of the urban centers of density and population concentration have begun to appear primarily in Kigali in the center of the country and then up along the north. And as a result of that, you can begin to see some of the effects on human health. And this is a map showing the prevalence of malaria rates. So as the population expands, the land becomes more degraded, there's a higher proximity between humans and animals, the risk of disease vector transmission also increases. And so between 1930 and 1960, it was still relatively low and generally less than 30%, more around 15% of the country was generally at risk. And then later in 1990 to 2000, that rate began to rapidly increase. And so again, it helps to illustrate this really intimate relationship between humans, animals, and their built environment. And so to really try to highlight that, I want to come back and now look at Volcanoes National Park, which is the national park found in the north of the country and it is the home to the mountain gorillas. It is really beautiful, but it's also very stark. This image shows the transition from the park on the right to the human occupied landscape adjacent to it. And again, it is home to these really amazing species that are one of our closest relatives and that are really important to help preserve. However, they've begun to hit a point of critical capacity if we aren't able to expand their habitat and begin to offer 
additional conservation support. Again, there ha this actually has been a conservation success story in recent history. The gorilla population has seen a resurgence in recent years, primarily as a result of these expanded conservation efforts. But again, it has now hit a ca capacity point where they really are not able to grow beyond the scale of their habitat. And so we want to talk a little bit about Diane Fossey, who has inspired a lot of this conservation impact and work. Uh, again, she was a renowned conservationist who helped to understand gorillas. And her quote here, I think, is a really be beautiful testimony of this. She said that saving gorillas is an important mission, yet the value of this mission relates beyond the forest to help the entire ecosystem. People and wildlife thrive together. So the story transitions and really begins to ha involve mass when we began to engage with the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. This is an organization that operates today within the national park in the north of the country, carrying on the legacy of Diane. And we met, when we met them, they had really outgrown their facility. This is where they had been operating at the time. It was a building that they were renting, which was in one of the closest adjacent cities but they were kind of bursting at the seams and not able to do the work that they needed to do in that space. And beyond that, the government of Rwanda had asked the question of, are you serious? Are you going to stay here? Because if you are, are you going to invest and show us your commitment long term to this work? And so there was a question about how committed are they really to these conservation efforts? which led us to developing a relationship to try to build a new home, a new campus for the organization, which would be in proximity to the edge of the park and their ongoing work with mountain gorillas, but also to serve as a hub for the local communities and a gateway for visitors. And so again, this shows the edge of the park. And then that little white symbol represents where we ended up helping identify a site for their new campus. When we came to the project, as we come to all projects, we try to come to it with a systems thinking approach. And this intention is really to think critically about what we are trying to achieve and what are the guiding principles that allow us to do that. And so this has been something that really comes through in all of our projects that we try to define upfront. The first is the mission, that each project must achieve a simple, legible, and transmissible idea. Again, I think we as designers like to get really jargony and academic and use words that like, make a lot of sense to us and begin to bring in critical theory. But we often forget that the communities that we work with do not use that same language. And we need to be able to really simply communicate it to everyone else to help to advocate for what our added value is. The second is immersion and context. This is really relevant for our work. Uh, in regeneration, especially in Rwanda, and that if we don't ask the right questions or build consensus, we may fail to serve the very people that we seek to serve. Third is proof of impact. The question is not if, but in what way and by how much. Again, every project can have impact. It is just a means of, ask, of aiming for it. Fourth, invest upstream. Who benefits from architecture services and at what cost? How do you make every dollar that goes into a project become embedded in that community and not just exported to a different place and a different uh, beneficiary. And finally, and fifth, justice is beauty. Everyone has a fundamental right to a built world that is beautiful and one that improves our quality of life. Again, it's a false binary that this is a privileged condition. So the pro provocation that we came to the project with was can a campus inspire conservation activism? And we try to ask a critical question at the outset of every project. And so trying to consider that within the realm of this one, uh, the first goal was to try to create a new home that was inspired by D Diane's original tent at the Karasoki Research Center. And this is a photo of where she lived. She lived up in the volcano in direct proximity to the gorillas. And that was a really important part of her work and her experience that led to her becoming a uh, conservation pioneer. 
And so this became a really rough concept sketch of what we wanted to try and achieve, where we took quite literally that idea of the tent in the woods and began to play with that as an architectural motif. And that by creating this new campus, we were creating a new home for the work that the Diane Fossey Fund does today, which is really these four main areas of work. First is education, that again, they're trying to train the next generation of conservation leaders that are from Rwanda and Africa. The second, conservation. They have ongoing work where they're monitoring the gorillas in the field, doing biological assessments, and actively engaged in the park. The third is research. They take samples, they bring it back. They take gorilla poop samples, and they bring them into a lab. They run some tests on it and learn more. And then finally, communities. And this is a really big one. Conservation is dependent on embedment in the communities that they are adjacent to. And without community support and benefit, conservation will fail. And so they are really trying to lead how the communities around the park are really interacting and benefiting. And so this is a plan that shows how that concept began to translate. Again, we really started, when we started the plot was essentially an agricultural site. It had been used for grazing and almost all of the intact species had been removed. And the objective in creating this new idea of a tent in the woods was to re-envision a rewilded site that would embody the identity of the park. And in doing so, create a living laboratory where the campus became a space of testing and experimentation and education and all of the work that is required to do conservation. And there are three main buildings that hold these efforts and programs. The first is the Conservation Gallery, which is in the top right of the image. That is home to an immersive exhibit space where people can come to or through and learn about conservation in a really interactive and playful way. The second is the Education Center, which is just to the left of that. This is a building dedicated to training and education. And again, they have a set of students and, that are trying to become conservationists. So this building helps to provide the facilities to support those activities. And then third is the Research Center, which is in the bottom of, of that image. And this is really, again, where the staff for the Fossey Fund work. And they bring samples from the field, have office spaces, and carry on their ongoing conservation activities. There's also student housing, which is in the top of the image, which was a major need. Again, a lot of people have to travel quite far to come here, and that ends up being a prohibitive factor to students being able to stay and learn. And so by providing housing, it meant that it was possible for them to take on this pursuit. There was some staff housing that it ended up getting VE'd out, but will hopefully be part of a future phase. I'll talk more about the landscape in detail. I'm just going to highlight the buildings there. Um, so if, again, the idea of trying to create a living laboratory really then transitioned next into this idea of creating an immersive landscape. And again, Diane, part of what really made her become the conservation pioneer that she was, was because she was living in the volcanoes in proximity to the gorillas and learned very intimately how they moved, how they lived, what it meant to understand them as a species that is similar but different than our own. And that in order to inspire conservation activism, we want to invite other visitors to do the same. That by being in an environment that helps to embody that same spirit, it will hopefully invigorate a similar sense of effort and understanding that you don't get when you're maybe just looking at a, a panel or a video or something that is more tactile and stationary. And so through that intention, we developed a series of immersive interpretive trails that became the core of the campus. And so each of these trails began to try to integrate a very different type of landscape experience that embodied a different lens of, again, how conservation works and how, what the identity of the park entails. And so the first was the Gorilla Trail, which is at the top of the image where you could follow the trail and see the life, a day in the life of a gorilla. The next was the Biodiversity Trail, which be brought you through a series of eco ecologies that were brought into juxtaposition 
to highlight the different characteristics of the volcano so that you could really walk through them and begin to feel and understand them. And then third was the research trail, which followed a, a wastewater treatment wetland, which was the first of its kind in the country and helped to educate around how water is treated and managed responsibly in a more natural uh, method. And then throughout the design process, we also thought really critically about what everything that went into and came out of the design would look like. And so that brings us to this idea of footprint and handprint. And so footprint entails everything from green roofs to reforestation of the landscape, soil reuse, the natural wastewater treatment wetlands, rainwater harvesting, really creating this robust landscape that helped to support these activities. And then handprint being all the more uh, hardscape or kind of mat hard materials that were intervened and brought to the site. And again, how we could find contextual materials that helped to support local workers and craftsmen and brought everything from the immediate vicinity helping to invest in that community. And so it includes everything from volcanic stone, which was used for the facades, floors, interiors, walls, like a whole array that really makes this holistic identity, but also becomes contextually a symbol of the place. Uh, the foundations were made of stone, which was a really big win, and local wood, locally fabricated furniture, and again, community engagement programs. And so now I wanna just quickly snap through some photos of what it looks like today. So today the campus is open and, open and operating and hopefully inspiring conservation activism. And so this is an image of the campus that looks out over the center and begins to show this composition of buildings and this idea again of a tent in the woods. From there we step a little bit closer and we see these really grand entries that, that are at the heart of each building that help to create this very seamless flow from interior to exterior to help to embody the idea of, of the presence of the natural environment throughout. That no matter where you are, you understand that proximity and presence and that it becomes this really vibrant part of the design language itself. As we step inside, we see a piece of the conservation gallery where again, there's a whole range of different interactive exhibits where you can learn, touch, listen, and play. And it encourages people to interact and learn at a lot of different levels in a way that hopefully is inviting and accessible to everyone. There is also a 360 degree immersive theater, which is really wild. <laughs> you walk in and it's dark and then you look around and it's gorillas in the forest. And it is super fun. You can like get up close and feel their presence in a way that's very playful. And part of this intention, again, is not everyone has access to go up into the volcanoes. So in order to help educate and inspire this activism, how do you sh demonstrate it to those who are not able to go? And really what's been amazing to see is the highest percentage of visitors have actually been those from the surrounding communities. I think at the onset of the project, a lot of people thought it might be more international based visitors because a lot of the international community comes to see the gorillas and a lot of the local community had never gone into the park. And instead what has been seen is quite the opposite. And school groups are coming through on a daily basis and the higher percentage of visitors have been the locals from the around surrounding area. Next, we will look at uh, the Central Assembly. This is a space in the heart of the campus that was really meant to bring people together in a space for celebration and convening. And a snapshot of how the planting has grown in. It's been about three years, I think, since the opening. And it's been, I was there earlier this year and it's been amazing to see it grow. And I'm gonna start to talk a little bit more about the planting, but there's a, I had a teaser. And then finally, here's a view that shows kind of a composition of these spaces at night and gives you a sense of the volcanoes in the background, which again, when you see, really highlights the proximity to the work that's happening in the landscapes around and brings this sense of awe and wonder. And so now I want to talk a bit more closely about the planting, because this was really a big piece of this project and something that we were really excited about. How to use planting in a really intentional, intensive way, where again, it becomes this tool for education about 
conservation and the ecologies of a functioning uh, ecosystem. And so what we did is we tried to integrate into the campus a representation of each of the ecotypes that are found up in the volcanoes. And so the diagram helps to start to highlight some of those areas and the associated ecologies which extend from mixed forest, hagania forest, bamboo, meadow, and su su subalpine. And when you look up on the profile of the volcanoes, it gives you a sense of how that distribution begins to relate to an elevational profile. And then I'll quickly walk through some of the spaces that embody this. Again, these are these immersive trails that when you walk through them, help you become more intimately engaged with what that ecosystem really looks and feels like. And so first we have the gorilla habitat. They have these like panels that you can carry around and you can like see gorillas on the trail, which is very fun. Um, and then you also walk along and along the path are these stopping points where it talks to you about how they rest, how they eat what their community is like and what a day in the life of a gorilla looks like. The next is the biodiversity trail. Again, here is where you see a juxtaposition of all of these ecologies and you begin to feel the differences between them. You get to learn about their composition and look at them and just kind of ask questions. And then lastly was the wastewater treatment wetland trail. Uh, this is a bit of an older photo. We need to get a new one. It like leads you down and extends you through the system, which is goes from, uh, I, I won't go into the details. Anyway, it's a lot of different types of wetlands that help to add up to a full treatment approach. And then the last piece was the development of reforestation test plots. And so this is from standing within one of them, but an, a portion of the site is dedicated to the creation of three test plots that looks at three different methodologies of reforestation. And this was done in part with the biologists, again, who are, have been a major partner through all of this, and it's meant to try to do initial testing that can help to inform future regeneration work that would happen around the area. So to dig in a little bit more closely to this planting, Again, really beautiful, diverse ecology uh, that's very charismatic and playful, but it was uh, not an easy feat to create. You cannot find these plants on the local market. Everything that you would find there is a non-native species, and beyond that, you can't really identify them. Oftentimes, there's no photos, there's not an easy book to go and reference. And so it took a lot of work, working very intimately with the biologists from the Diane Fossey Fund who do know these plants very intimately. And it became this really great collaborative process of trying to not only know, are these the right ones? What do they look like? How do we find them? How do we propagate them? And how do we propagate them at scale so that they will be implemented and successful? And we had a site nursery that was on the property where we <coughs> propagated over 200,000 plants that were grown there and sourced from the adjacent area, which eventually then were implemented. And the results today have been really remarkable and exciting to see. The Diane Fossey team just released a research paper that documents their findings, having done ongoing measurements of the plants on site and they found that more than 95% of plants are alive after two years, demonstrating that the plantings were appropriate for the local ecosystem. Again, this is, may not seem like a big thing, but it really is. When we talk about wanting to do regenerative design across a larger contextual scale, and you can't easily find or identify those plants or know that they're going to succeed, this campus has started to serve as a precedent for that and is now building new information that will hopefully extend out to others. In addition, it started to function as a real habitat. And so over the two years of data collection, the presence of birds grew and diversified to include 52 species, some of which you only normally find in the national park, which begins to indicate that it is actually having the ecological function of the park after a very short turnover time. And then finally, there's been quite a bit of impact evaluation. Again, after our projects, we tried to do a lot of testing to understand did these things come true. And we, through a survey of workers on site, while most people believed the conservation was important, it was really exciting to see that 10% of people increased that response from not only did they agree, but they strongly agree. And that they're bringing that importance and these learnings home and they're enacting them in their communities with their own families. 
And so this is a visual that helps to summarize a bunch of the impact tracking that we did. I won't go into all of it because I also think we're probably going to run over from the technical challenges. <laughs> but um, just to call out a couple, uh, economy, I think, and equity are two that we haven't really talked about. 99% uh, of the employees were Rwandan, and 23% of those employees were women. And it really, a lot of the investment ended up going into the local economy. 13.4 million ended up being invested in Rwanda. And so that, that's an overview of the Diane Fossey campus project. But what has also been exciting is that the relationship and that those findings didn't end there. It's actually now extended and our client has become our collaborator. And we have since been working with them on the development of a master plan for the expansion of Volcanoes National Park. And so again, this is Volcanoes National Park at the north of the country. Again, it shares a border with the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Uganda. And the intensity of this border is really seen through these really artificial hard edges. And the dash or the line around shows what is being currently studied as an area for, pot for potential expansion. And when you look at it, again, it's a really stark contrast, uh, but it helps to highlight how much this has changed and how it has resulted in a less than symbiotic relationship across that boundary and that there's opportunity to try to create a more intentional relationship that will hopefully expand the park to allow for the gorilla population to expand beyond its current carrying capacity. But you know, this is an extremely complex project, and that is an understatement. The government has been working towards it for years, and we've been a partner in that process, but really in the last year and a half have been working very diligently towards a land use plan that starts to envision what that could actually look like. But again, it, it ties into a very complex history. Um, the park was the first established national park on the continent in 1925, and that diagram over on the left shows what used to be the original footprint of the national park. It used to be much larger than it is today, but again, through, through population growth and internal conflict and a lot of change, that uh, the park boundaries were greatly reduced. And so now the idea of trying to expand it is to look to restore some of that lost land, but how to do it without, without displacing people and being at the detriment of the communities around that are dependent upon this landscape. And so it really comes into three themes of land use and land planning. The first is conservation. Again, how does this ecology work? What does it look like? How does the park functionally appear as a landscape? The second is agriculture. This is known as the bread basket of the country. It's some of the most fertile soils because it's largely volcanic and it's home to a huge area of production. And then third, settlements. Again, while it's not super densely populated, there are a lot of people living in this landscape. And how is it that this expansion happens with them as a constituent and an advocate? And so those typologies simplify into these three categories, which then we further define into a subset of different uses. So for example, under settlements, it includes everything from tourism to trading centers, admin offices, schools, health centers, infrastructure. Under agriculture, it subdivides into a huge range of typologies from pyrethrum to potato farming to floriculture. And in conservation, we have the park itself, but also research centers, admin offices, research, oh, that's a duplicate, <laughs> uh, and then uh, habitat corridors. And so today, the condition of the park looks like this. Again, it's really this biodiverse extension of the ecology and then a sharp boundary where it transitions immediately into a settled landscape. And our proposed alteration to this condition is to integrate a buffer zone. This is a pretty universal approach towards trying to create a more intentional, softened relationship between conservation areas and settled areas so that you have more symbiotic uses that begin to trans transition more softly so that there isn't as much conflict between the park and humans. And the word conflict is very accurate. 
There is quite a bit of human-animal-wildlife conflict occurring today, where parks com uh, animals come out of the park into the adjacent communities, leading to conflict with the community, which ends up being bad for both uh, parties. And so this is really simplified. There's a lot of research in GIS mapping and suitability mapping and <laughs> economic evaluation, and we're not going to go into any of that. But just to really like simply try to articulate, how do we come to this as designers again? We're not really necessarily the experts in a lot of this work. We are part of a much bigger team who has that expertise that allows us to become a collaborative partnership of people who have the right set of skills. So we were working with a socioeconomic consultant, the Diane Fossey team as the conservation and biologist experts, uh, a urban planner who is very familiar with all of the zoning and use guidelines from the country. And then we were trying to bring this idea of design thinking and how do you cross all of those areas of thought to create a strategy that is simple and uh, implementable. And so first, the idea, again, is of creating a human and nature gradient. This idea of a buffer zone that creates suitable relationships between the different uses. Then we look to optimize those designations, knowing that it is not a simple intervention, but based on all the mapping and understanding of those complexities, we're going to push and pull depending on what's happening where. Then third is the designation of settlements and the scaling of those settlements. Fourth is the integration of roads and infrastructure, what's existing, what needs to be upgraded, what should be removed, the subdivision of the land uses across agriculture, settlement typologies, tourism, et cetera, and then the integration of connective corridors. Again, that these ecologies are not static, that they should extend through these zones in response to hydro hydrological systems, et cetera. And that begins to translate into this sort of buildup of layers. So those three zones begin to have the associated subtypologies, which are associated based on how compatible they are with conservation or settlements, and that they begin to cre create, again, a more intentional composition rather than what you see today, which is really just one very harsh transition which will look something like this. This is a really fast graphic to help to just communicate again what is a really big complex idea to a lot of people. This has involved meetings with all of the governmental entities, all the communities, all the enterprises and business owners. And to be able to communicate all of this simply and clearly is an important part of getting buy-in and hearing everyone and being able to incorporate their feedback. <laughs> And then the last thing I'll touch on before we end is some of the metrics that we've done. Again, we always try to do a qualitative, quantitative evaluation that leads from analysis and research into monitoring and evaluation afterwards. And so since this is really still at the front end, we're at this point in being able to communicate the added value of the expansion. And how do we begin to put numbers on ecological value that people normally don't really see very clearly unless they have a deep appreciation for it already. And so this is a tool that we've started to use from Ecosystem Intelligence, and it's a pretty simple, kind of fast way to get some general metrics to begin to help to communicate these ideas. And basically it looks at how the benefits from this transition in land use will begin to equate into air quality, biodiversity, water quality, health and well-being, et cetera. And so on the left, you see the existing conditions. In the middle, we see proposed. And on the right, you see what a reference habitat would be, or the idea of if the entire area was in its natural state, what would that benefit be? And so we can see that with this initial proposal, there could be up to two times an increase in the ecosystem service benefits that would come from the park expansion. And there's also this very robust document that's like 100 pages that talks about the economic side of things and what does it mean, again, to begin to transition land uses and types of agriculture, diversify them, and what would the impacts then be to the community and that the could potentially result in a 36% increase to the annual average income for families in the area. And so that's really just a snapshot of much bigger project, but I think it helps to hopefully communicate how, again, do you think about 
really complex ideas around regeneration, conservation, from the scale of where do you find the plants, how do you propagate them, how do you implement them so people can interact with it, learn from it, begin to care about it if they had a heaven, and then how does that begin to transition all the way up to the scale of land use planning that will set new precedent for how we begin to rewild lost landscapes and provide new habitat for greater biodiversity. So hopefully that was interesting and I'm looking forward to questions and comments. Hey, does anyone have any questions? Um, and just a reminder, this mic does not amplify, it's only for recording, so speak loudly. <laughs> So you were talking about how you had to propagate pretty much all plant material for your site. Uh, what were some of the difficulties and setbacks? Um, I'm sure you had a lot of them as you continue this project to get those, I guess. Yeah, great question. Uh, again, it, there were a lot of them. <laughs> I think the first one was, again, the ability to find the right information, to know the species that are typical for these ecologies is not super well documented. It involved digging into really, really old research articles, some of them from Diane Fossey, and trying to see like what are all the species, then meeting with the biologists to try to show them, here's an initial list, are these the right ones? How do you all understand that? So that was the first hurdle, I think, is just proper identification and selection. The second was then, uh, again, sourcing and being able to actually identify them. You can know the Latin name and understand its general biology, but if you can't look at the plant and know it's the right one, you can't know that you're actually propagating the right thing. And so that also was a big effort of trying to track down imagery and work with a biologist to try to understand that species identification was appropriate. After that, it was propagation. <laughs> How do you propagate plants that people really haven't been propagating? And there was a lot of trial and error and everything from cuttings to kind of splitting and you know lots of different propagation methods and on a very tight timeline. You don't talk about that part very often, but you know we're propagating while construction is going on. If these plants don't live, we're going to be in trouble. And thankfully they did for the most part. We had to do a little bit of adjustment in some of the percentages based on which were harder to propagate than others. But again, it was really great because I think overall it was a success and hopefully we'll now document a whole scale of ecological information that hasn't been as accessible in the past. And the last one I'll say is uh, con the contractor selection. Uh, Again, you can select a contractor, but if they don't know the species, then can they really do the work? And we talked for a while about, are we gonna do the work? But we were actually leading the building. We were the general contractors for this project. Mass started a contracting entity and built the campus. And so we thought about doing Softscape as well. But again, because of how intense of a knowledge set it requires, felt that it was a little bit too much and we ended up selecting a contractor. But the reality is we ended up doing a lot of the work anyway because they didn't really know the species intimately. So it became a collaboration between the researchers, our team, and then the contractor. So uh, when it comes to, and if I change my major, um, I'm gonna blame it on you because that was awesome. <laughs> But do, do you find yourself now being a, a conservationist who happens to be a landscaper, mm. or is it the other way around for you? Uh, no, I would not say so. I think that we are, I, I'm still a landscape architect, but where I, I try to sit in the space in between people who have a lot of knowledge to bring it together into a designed, uh, articulated format. And I'm realizing now when we had the glitch in the presentation, I had included a couple of slides that were talking about this idea of One Health, which is the approach that really informs all of this work. It is um, an approach towards 
interdisciplinary understanding of human, animal, and ecological health that originally stemmed more out of veterinary science, but it has a lot of applications, and especially within the built environment as it relates to humans, animals, and ecologies coming together. And so that, that's at the heart of the, both of these projects. It's also at the heart of the Rwanda Institute of Conservation Agriculture. And so we as designers help to look at Again, a lot of areas of specialization, the biologists being the people who really know how to do conservation, uh, the socioeconomic experts who know the influence that it has on these communities, the agricultural consultants who know how to grow things and what and where, and then we try to bring all the information together and say, what does that look like in a design approach? And how do we make everything work together symbiotically when some of those disciplines might not always be communicating together? Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm like, <laughs> I think I got there. Um, on behalf of all of us, thanks for coming. Just absolutely awesome work. And you stimulate so many thoughts that are, I think, on the minds of many people. And probably the most fundamental thought is, how do I become you? <laughs> um, and so talk a little bit about your training and how you are effective as a landscape architect in such a dynamic and really architecturally dominated world, maybe. I mean, the firm is started by architects. What's that relationship like? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think I've mentioned it to a couple of people now, but Mass, I do believe, is still predominantly viewed as an architecture firm. Not as many people realize the breadth of the work that we do and that actually we have a big landscape team. We lead a lot of really big landscape projects and I think more and more that's starting to become apparent and more and more a lot of the projects in the office are starting to be very landscape focused and the architects are equally interested in that. So that's really exciting and I think at the foundation the collaborators and everybody who comes to Mass again really just wants to solve really big difficult problems. People are not necessarily concerned about disciplinary boundaries in the way a more traditional practice approach is. It's again, what is the issue and how do we solve for it? And by having such a multidisciplinary team, we're able to pull people in across a lot of areas of thought and think about it really holistically and critically in a way that it isn't as limited or siloed. And so I think as a landscape architect within Mass, that's been one of the things I've appreciated the most. I have learned like learned a ton from working with so many architects and a big piece of that has been how to communicate our value when maybe they don't themselves understand it and that equally applies to pr a practicing in Rwanda where the profession doesn't exist yet and is starting to grow and we have a Rwandan landscape architect on our team who's going to be helping to build the profession there and so it becomes Again, a really critical conversation, not only of cross-disciplinary collaboration, but also international collaboration and how do we support across political boundaries when our natural world does not work within those constraints. Um, so those are some of the frames around our practice. And then for myself, I came through a little bit of a weirder path. I you know, went to the University of Minnesota for my undergraduate. I started into their graduate program, but had this deep desire to be out in the world <laughs> and just experience through immersion. And so at a certain point, I, like, I was like, I'm going to go out and look and see and learn. And then I came across this very unique program in Spain that was also multidisciplinary about expanding the reaches of design and architecture into places where it doesn't normally reach. So I was working with entities like the UN and Doctors Without Borders and very un untraditional areas of design application and that had a pretty fundamental influence I would say around we can attend to really big issues and there is a need and not many people are and a lot of that has to do with the constraints by which we practice and that if we are able to try to step outside of that and look bigger think more holistically try to build relationships that lead to the opportunities that are needed then it allows us to do things in a very different way. Um, and so I think I, because of my less traditional route, I also tend to 
find a lot of attraction to just thinking about things very holistically rather than in a more applied design way. And then you find all the creative design solutions and you pull them in.